Good morning, everyone. I am Jessie Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocates, and I'm so glad to see all of you here for our first forum of 2021. Thank you all for joining us today, uh, whether it's your first time uh, or you uh, joined these forums a lot during 2020. So we are recording today's forum to share later as both a video and a podcast. And because of that, we ask that you stay muted uh, but we are taking questions and comments via the chat feature. I know several of you submitted questions when you RSVP'd, so we've tried to incorporate those into comments, um, and if you don't hear an answer to your question, put it into that chat. If we can, we'll answer it as we go, and if not, we can follow up with you later. So with all of that, I am now going to turn it over to Terry Brooks. Hey, thanks, Jesse, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, Merry 2021, uh, and uh, this is your chance to set a New Year's resolution to get a perfect attendance pin for the 2021 uh, Advocacy Forum. So uh, some of you guys uh, already have done that last year, so we're going to do fresh attendance books, so set that as your goal. Uh, you know, uh, lots of folks... Uh, argue when we think about lifestyles, whether compartmentalization or integration uh, is the way to go. Uh, do you separate your life into components or do you integrate that? And, and we all have those experiences where can you, can you segment uh, your brain and your heart? Uh, you know, it's you've ordered this great gourmet pizza to watch a ball game, but your team is losing. Can you enjoy the pizza and still watch the game or you just can't do that? Uh, you know, the holiday season, uh, most of us probably have really good experiences and then ungood experiences. How do you integrate and how do you compartmentalize? Uh, this is just for me. Uh, so it may or may not be applicable to you. I, I don't know in my role as someone who tries to give voice to children if there's ever been a more important moment to compartmentalize. Uh, we could very candidly spend this entire hour on events in Washington and across this country. Uh, we could dissect, diagnose, and commiserate, and, and I understand that. Uh, however, uh, that is not the way right now that you can help Kentucky's kids. So, you know, what I want to encourage you to do is to compartmentalize your uh, understandable emotions about civic life in this nation regardless of where you may be on the political spectrum. Uh, but, but I want you to compartmentalize that and I want you to embrace the idea that we are at a unique and decisive moment for kids in Kentucky. Let's just make sure we're all on the same page. So never, never, never before have we had a situation where the General Assembly and the governor are going to pass a one-year budget, which in very, very many ways will be the predicate to a two-year budget in 2022, right? So what's on the table in my mind is really a three-year budget, not a one-year budget. They only have 30 days in a session to do that. What is typically a last minute process, some of you uh, veterans will remember like I do that maybe uh, 10 years ago, uh, then Senate President David Williams literally unplugged the clock uh, on the last evening of the last day of the session so that they could legally pass a budget because they were gonna run out of time, okay? So normally it's last gasp, are they gonna to finish today? Not the case. 
Uh, I will not be surprised if the Senate passes its budget today, which means that we will have had a governor's budget, a House budget, and a Senate budget all passed in, what, less than a week? Well, by their own words, the words of the governor, the words of the Speaker of the House, and the words of the Senate president, the three budgets that are going to be at play in a matter of hours are just first drafts. They're really just get something on the table so the real work begins. And what I want to implore uh, and, and, uh, and hopefully embolden you to realize is there is going to be unprecedented opportunity. Let me emphasize that word, opportunity for each of you and all of us to weigh in in the next couple weeks because all those House members and all those Senate members are going home. That is the time that we need you working on two things, messaging on the budget and messaging on policy. Uh, the, the thing that I would encourage you to do is don't feel as if you have to tackle the whole world. My guess is looking at the folks on this, on the, uh, on the screen, uh, most of you have a couple things about which you are especially passionate. You care about kids, but boy, you really care about this aspect or that aspect of what it means to grow up as a, as a little boy or a little girl in Kentucky. I want to really tell you that this is the moment when those legislators head home for you to work them. Uh, you should be talking to your senator and your representative, but you also should be uh, working House and Senate leadership, and you should be talking to the governor's office. So again, if, if you're coming to this call today and you're feeling unsettled because of the national narrative, Man, I get that. In fact, I'm, I'm kind of glad that you feel unsettled because we should all feel unsettled because of the national narrative. But what I don't want us to do is to be so absorbed in that that we lose the opportunity, that we lose the opportunity for Kentucky's kids. And that's what today is about. Our goal would be that you leave today understanding what policies are on the table. I'm sure that somewhere in this forum, Jesse or someone is going to tell you how to uh, go to, to our website and get budget analysis so that as you talk to those legislators, you can ask questions like, where is this part of the budget? Where is that part of the budget? So Kentucky's kids are counting on you to absolutely be concerned about the national narrative, but they're also counting on you to give full-throated support to them in the immediate, and that's really an obligation as well as an opportunity we all have. So thanks for being here. Uh, put, your, put your big boy boots on, uh, compartmentalize, and uh, let's make our voices heard for Kentucky's kids in the immediate. Jesse, I think I'm supposed to kick it back to you. You are. Thank you, Terry. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna get those big girl boots on right now for compartmentalizing and uh, kick us off today with a conversation with some of my brilliant colleagues here at Kentucky Youth Advocates. So we're gonna give an overview of kind of the first eight days of the session thus far. Uh, talk a little bit about what's different about, I mean, there's a lot of things different about this session, but what's different about this session in terms of um, updates from, or like meetings with legislators and stuff like that, and then talk a little bit about some tools for all of you, and just know that all of the tools and uh, reference things that we talk about today, we're going to be sending those out to you, and we can link those 
if you're listening to this on the podcast, we can link those in the show notes as well. So you don't have to remember all of those. So today we're going to hear from our policy directors, Mehet Kalra, Courtney Downs, and Ben Geese, and also Mara Powell, who is going to tell us some about uh, communications tools and engagement opportunities. So we're going to start with Mahek. And Terry touched on this a little bit, but you know, when we planned this forum, we thought we would be looking back at last week. We'd be having a moment to catch our breath this week because we expected, you know, the legislators to be in recess now, like they're usually in recess for, for a few weeks during the odd numbered years. But instead, it's day eight of the legislative session. So uh, just what's going on this year and what is so different about this year's legislative session in general? Thanks, Jesse. Um, so that's a great question. There's so much changing right now and there's many moving pieces that could be a little daunting for advocates across the state. You know, we've had a, a glimpse of a revised schedule We've had new safety measures in place. We've kind of seen the flow of committee and chamber meetings. And also we've had a budget proposal moving through. And of course, last but not least, we have new legislators as well. But not everything is new this General Assembly. Um, let's not forget that it's a short 30 day session and the schedule is broken into two different parts. So the first part was the legislative session kicked off January 5th and it lasts until today, so that's part one. And then the legislators are gonna be coming back Tuesday, February 2nd for the remainder of the 30 day period. Um, and additionally, as Terry alluded to, we must pass a one year budget during this time. And I know Courtney's gonna dive into that in a little bit. But there's also changes that have been made to the process and flow of committee meetings. So committee meetings are only gonna be an hour long in the House and Senate to allow for a room for cleaning and those safety precautions in place due to COVID-19. Um, all committee meetings are gonna be streamed online. So that's great news on the KET website. Um, and then also we're gonna have a 24 hour notice of what's gonna be allowed to be heard. So the agenda will just be updated 24 hours in advance, which is different from last year. Um, also with testimony this year, obviously folks have always testified in person or submitted comments, but this year you could testify virtually, which is a great option if you do not feel comfortable in testifying in person. Um, there's also assigned committee rooms as well. So the house has the largest the larger committee rooms for obvious reasons because of many members. And then there's um, Senate um, committee rooms as well that are assigned. And then masks are required in committee rooms. One big um, key difference as well is unlike previous years, proposed legislative bills will not be automatically assigned to committees. Um, so that again is a key difference from the previous years. So thank you for that kind of rundown of some big updates for the session. That last bit that you mentioned about bills not being automatically assigned to committees. So I think that's actually a really important piece that advocates may not realize that that's something that typically happens throughout um, the session is that those just get automatically assigned. They may never be heard, but they at least get to a committee. But with them not being assigned, that means some of them may never even get to a committee. So is there something that advocates can do uh, to try and nudge those towards a committee? Certainly, um, and it's going back to the point that Terry just alluded to moments ago, it's really encouraging our advocates to reach out to floor leaders in their respective chambers. So if it's a Senate bill, reach out to Senator Thayer, and if it's a, um, if it's a House bill, reach out to Representative Rudy, and also the committee chairs. It's important to ensure that they're moving the process forward as well. So that's what I would suggest. Great, thank you. And information about like uh, the committee chairs and um, where, at how to contact them, that is on the LRC website. And then we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but there is some information um, about that 
on the website so you can find out who that is if you don't already know. Um, okay, so just to continue our theme of everything being kind of upended, advocates are uh, probably already aware that it's not business as usual, you know, in terms of meeting with their legislator. So if advocates do want to get in contact with their legislator or um, have some kind of meeting with them, can you tell advocates a little bit about just what some of those new protocols are and, and other ways to get in touch uh, with our legislator? Certainly, yeah. So um, right now, the general public access to the Capitol and annex buildings are not allowed. So the only way you are allowed is um, if you have a meeting. So again, it's important to schedule those meetings, um, whether it is um, in person or through Zoom, reaching out to your legislator is very important. Um, and if you don't, if you haven't done so already, um, feel free to email them or even call them or call their office um, as well. And, and if you don't know who your legislators are, I'm sure there's gonna be a link that magically appears in a few minutes. Um, feel free to use that link to find out who, you're rep who represents you. Um, additionally, you'll be required to wear a mask to, that's covering your nose and mouth the entire time while you're in the Capitol building or annex. So I just wanted to point that out um, as that is a new, um, a new piece of information. And additionally, um, this year in particular, um, once you're um, in the Capitol building, um, the staff person is going to lead you to the room and there's going to be a limit of three people that can join that meeting. Usually, you know, you just let your um, the legislative staff know how many um, individuals are joining you, but this year they're limiting it to three people. Um, also, that legislative assistant will, like I said, will um, escort you to your meeting and then you are going to be escorted out immediately after that meeting time. And these rules are the same for lobbyists and for advocates, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. All right, so we have the lay of the land, which feels like an ever-changing landscape uh, for what's going on in Frankfurt, you know, in terms of accessibility at the Capitol and contacting legislators. So let's dig in to policy. And there is in some ways a lot to cover here and in some ways just a little bit because they've been focused so much on the budget during these first seven days and now the eighth day of the session. So there's a lot that um, we could cover in the budget and in terms of other bills. So we're and we're just going to focus on a few things today. And we're going to start with the blueprint for Kentucky's children bills. And as you all probably remember from a few weeks ago, way back in 2020, we talked about the blueprint for Kentucky's children policy priorities. And we can um, include a link and send out more info about those priorities. But we already have a few bills that have been filed that relate to those priorities. So, Courtney, would you want to tell us a little bit more about what's happened with those bills, with what bills we have during the first seven, eight days of the General Assembly? Sure. Yeah. Um, so. We have, so I'll start with a, a health related bill. So Senate Bill 81 was sponsored by Senator Rocky Adams. And then we also have uh, House Bill 147, which is sponsored by Representative Mosher and Bojanowski. And these are identical bills that will repeal tobacco preemption and allow local governments to regulate the sale, the display, and the use of tobacco products. Um, and so as we talked about a few weeks ago, what we know is that city and, and county governments can see firsthand how effective tobacco control policies are um, and how they can improve the health of their constituents long term. And when they have this discretion and they're able to tailor local ordinances to meet the unique needs of their communities um, and ensure they can ensure that they're um, enforced effectively. So 
currently state law preempts local governments from using their discretion. So if this legislation passes, then it will correct that. Um, the House bill hasn't been assigned just yet, but the Senate bill, um, when I checked yesterday, it was assigned to the Committee on Committees. Um, and I want to point out also that one of the good things about having an identical bill that's filed in both um, the House and the Senate is that if it passes both chambers simultaneously and there aren't any modifications made, then it can just go directly to the governor. Um, the next one that I want to talk about is paid family leave. And there are two uh, bills that were filed in the House. So there's House Bill 42, which is sponsored by Representative Raymond, and then House Bill 54, which was sponsored by Representative Nemus. Um, and so this would allow employees of the Commonwealth of Kentucky um, a paid leave of absence of 12 weeks for the birth or the adoption of a child. And it also would establish requirements for the paid leave of absence. Um, and again, what we know is that paid family leave contributes to fewer incidents of pediatric abusive head trauma, fewer infant deaths, um, it improves maternal mental health, and then for employers, it can really boost employee morale, which then reduces turnover, um, and it also creates an incentive for potential employees. Um, and so both of these bills were pre-filed actually back in, in September, so it's been a while. Um, and neither of them have been assigned to a committee yet. Um, the reason, now these bills are nearly identical, um, but there's only like one slight difference, which is why there's two of the bills. So House Bill 42 says that once leave has been approved, a parent shall be granted 12 weeks and that's it. But House Bill 54 adds on that once they get the 12 weeks, um, they have to be used within 24 weeks of the birth or the adoption of the child. So it's just a subtle difference, but that difference requires two completely different bills. Um, and then the last one is the Juvenile Justice Bill. It's uh, Senate Bill 36, and it's sponsored by Senator Westerfield. And this one is going to remove the automatic transfer of a child from district court, which is where the juvenile cases are heard, um, to circuit court, which is where adult cases are heard. Um, and it would allow additional factors to be considered as well when determining if a child's case should be transferred. Um, so as I've said before, this wouldn't prevent anyone from being held accountable. It simply allows judges to take the same factors into considerations for crimes that involve a firearm as they would for every other case that's on their docket. So this bill has already been assigned to the Senate Judiciary. Um, and the next step really is just for it to have a hearing when session resumes. And the um, chairman of the Senate Judiciary is also the sponsor of the bill. So I feel pretty good that it'll get, get the hearing. So um, I guess now I'm gonna turn it over to Ben for budget items. Absolutely, and thank you so much, Courtney. I appreciate that. And hello and good morning to all of you today. Uh, pleasure to be with you and happy to walk you through some budget items. I wanna, before we uh, dive into those details, I wanna say that there are a lot of elements in this budget that we could talk about, but we're only gonna focus on a few today. Uh, the following items represent areas of intense need throughout the Commonwealth, and some are priorities that are even shared among the Bashir administration and the state legislature. Our intent today is to showcase areas of agreement and continue to push for increased investments in other critical areas. We know that a budget is a value statement and we're counting on you out in the audience to make each of these values a high priority in the minds of your state legislators. The first that we wanna talk about today centers around the digital divide. Um, there is an increase in spending in both the governor's budget and in the house budget. Um, for increase to access to broadband internet. Uh, we know that this is an issue that impacts those both in rural Kentucky and in urban Kentucky. Just yesterday, for example, Kentucky Youth Advocates were meeting with a group of inspired youth who plan to get together to use their voice to be good citizens. Of course, we're having to do that virtually. And unfortunately, a student wasn't able to participate as much as she would have liked because of her broadband internet connection. And I have to say that really tugged on my heartstrings because if that student can't participate in an extracurricular, we know she's finding it difficult to participate in virtual learning as well. But it's also important to note that when it comes to education and equitable education to be more specific, that access to broadband internet was important before the pandemic, it's important during the pandemic, and it's gonna be even more important after the pandemic. 
We also want you to consider the benefits that uh, broadband connection has for one's health and equitable treatment in healthcare as telehealth continues to be so important during this time and will only grow in influence as the years pass on. So please reach out, tell your representatives to support funding for greater equitable access to broadband internet. It's one of the biggest issues of our time. Um, next, we wanna talk about another big issue uh, around school safety. Um, we noticed that there was an increase of some $50 million in investing in physical upgrades to schools, but also in mental health services in schools. Uh, this is a critical part of the Commonwealth of Kentucky's school safety work uh, that originated in the school safety bill a few years back. Uh, at KYA, we like to say that this focuses on the hardware, the physical improvements to a physical school building, but also the hardware the relationship building that educators can do with students in focusing on their mental health and their social and emotional well-being. We know that these things are incredibly important. Uh, we know that while some schools uh, continue to remain closed, uh, this is a good time, an opportune time to get in and make physical improvements to a school building safety. While the kids aren't there, they won't be interrupted. Uh, we know that social emotional needs and mental health needs are going through the roof for youth during this time. Uh, due to the pandemic and the social unrest that we've experienced for some time now. So this is an absolutely critical time for each of those investments. And we hope that you'll get on the phone to your legislator to let them know how critical it is. Um, next, and certainly not any less of importance, um, is support to both child abuse pediatricians and for additional social workers. As I'm sure many of you know, um, Kentucky has the very shameful accolade of being number one in the entire United States of America for child abuse and neglect. And I know it, it kind of rubs me the wrong way when we say that repeatedly, but we still don't invest money to solve that problem. Unless we get serious about it, we're gonna remain number one on that list. And frankly, it's shameful and totally uh, irredeemable to remain at the top of that list. Uh, there is a nugget of optimism. Uh, the governor's budget did include uh, funding for an additional 76 social workers, which we know are desperately needed. Uh, but something that neither the governor or the House's budget address that we want you to get on the phone and uh, talk about um, is increased support for child abuse pediatricians. Uh, we know that they have an absorbent workload uh, and it's causing poor outcomes for kids. We need to make sure that these professionals are supported so they can support our Commonwealth's most valuable asset and that's our children, and health and safety is number one. Um, next, and an issue that's certainly very important to me uh, is kinship care, uh, which has received flat funding in the budget. So the funding is still there, but it's flat uh, per last years. Um, with this one, it's very important to me because um, I grew up in a kinship home. Uh, I, was, I wasn't physically taken away from my parents, but my parents took in some cousins of mine in about 2002. So in that year, I went uh, from being a single child and my parents went from having to feed and educate one child to having to feed and educate five total children. Um, they did the right thing, but it was an incredible burden on the family. So we need to make sure that those families are supported because we know that it's in the best interest of those children to remain with someone that they're more familiar with, if at all possible. Um, another item to lift up um, is increased enrollment outreach for Medicaid services. Um, we know that in the governor's budget, there was included an investment of about a million dollars. And fortunately, that was taken out of the House of Representatives budget. And we know how important access is to medical services during this time. One of the last items that I'd like to speak to you about today um, is support for the child care sector, uh, particularly the CCAP program or the child care assistance program. Um, it remains at flat funding and eligibility remains for those at about 160% FPL or at the federal poverty level. Um, nice to see that it's not cut, but folks, we've really got to grow that. Uh, when we take a look at the hurt that the child care sector has experienced throughout the pandemic, Now's the time to really shore up the sector, give it all the support it needs to survive, so that way in the future it can thrive. And when we look at eligibility for CCAP, 
really our goal is to get that to 200% of FPL. Right now it's at 160, so we've got a little ways to go. Uh, think about all the economic hardship that parents are going through right now. Uh, expanding eligibility to that service is something that's needed now more so than ever. And it's very important when we consider that childcare is a part of the economic infrastructure of Kentucky. If kids can't be sent off to childcare, how do we expect parents to go off to work? I know that's a lot to take in, uh, but I have faith in each of you that you will get on the phone, get on your email, schedule those meetings, and raise these issues of consequence with our leaders in Frankfurt. And for a little bit more about what the rest of this budget process is going to look like, I'm going to pass it back to my friend and colleague, Courtney Downs. All right. Courtney. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Um, and I, it's, it's a passion of mine, so I just want to make one more plug for the funding for child abuse pediatricians. Um, and I, I just, I have to say that we only have five for the entire state. And one of them only provides medical services for kids who have been sexually abused or assaulted. So this funding would go to help expand those teams and to make sure that we're reaching these vulnerable children all across the state when they need it the most, because right now we're missing a lot of kids. So I just wanted to make that one final plug. Um, and I also just wanna now walk you through what the process uh, for getting the budget, the budget to the governor, governor's desk will look like. The info is a little bit wonky, so I'm going to try to explain it as plainly as possible. Um, so as Jesse said, the, the legislature has been in session since January 5th, and um, during this time, the governor uh, has shared his budget proposal, and then the House also filed a continuation version of the budget in an effort to expedite the process since it is such a short session. Um, and a continuation budget, for those who don't know, is, is basically what it sounds like. It's, it's like, how can we maintain the budget that we had or that we developed in 2020 in 2021? Um, so the House continuation budget was voted out of committee on Monday night, and then it was introduced to the Senate where it was similarly voted out of committee yesterday. So now the House, or now the Senate floor, excuse me, um, will vote on this House continuation budget. Uh, then the appointed members from both chambers, the House and the Senate, will participate in what's called a conference committee. Um, and this just gives them the opportunity to flesh out the details of the budget immediately. Um, so the legislature will be in recess until February 2nd, but the conference committee members will still be able to meet even during the break, and we anticipate that that will happen. Um, and then once a consensus is reached and the budget bill passes each chamber, it will be sent to the governor to sign. So I am going to throw it back to Mahek, who will walk us through a few other bills that uh, impact children and families. Thanks, Courtney and Ben. Um, so I just wanted to note that there's a hundreds of bills filed every year. And though our blueprint policies is our common ground policy agenda supported by 100 partners, there's many policies and programs that really ensure all children in Kentucky are safe, healthy, and secure. So with bills being filed every day, I'm only gonna highlight a few bills that we have seen already. Um, and just like child advocates know, um, there's bills that we're supportive of and there's bills that we need to take a defensive stance. For an instance, um, for over a decade now, KYA has been actively advocating for the elimination of corporal punishment in schools. And Representative Riley has already filed this bill and will continue to monitor it. Additionally, um, Senator Kerr and Representative Wilner have filed bills to ban conversion therapy, and we know that this practice is ineffective and brings trauma to children. But like I said, there's bills that we have to play defense, up, defense on. Um, so the past couple of years, we've seen a surge of anti-vaccination bills, and we know that childhood vaccinations are a long-supported preventive service to protect children and adults from infection disease, infective infectious diseases. <laughs> um, additionally, there's um, anti-fluoride bills that have been filed in the House and Senate as well. And for over 70 years now, um, public water providers have had the direct connection to improving the oral health system um, for Kentucky. And so these are two bills that we just wanted to flag as defensive bills since we've noticed them already in the House and Senate. But every day, like I said, new bills are going to be filed. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jesse to talk more about um, 
ways that you all as advocates can take action. Thanks, Mahek. Yeah, it's as you, uh, a couple of things struck me as, as you all um, were talking. And the first is just hearing you all talk about all of these legislators who are longtime champions for children. So just a shout out to all of those legislators and others who are sponsoring these bills that are good for kids and their families and who are helping those bills move forward um, in, uh, in, the, in their committees or in their chambers. So thank you to those legislators. And a reminder to advocates that sometimes taking action can also mean saying thank you. So uh, just as you are contacting your legislators about maybe some things that need to be changed, um, also remember to thank them when they when things go well and um, things happen that are uh, worth praising. So just to keep that in mind. And the other thing that struck me is that, wow, a whole lot has already happened and there's so much already in this budget. And we are gonna try to keep you as advocates as informed as possible so that you can take whatever action is needed. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mara who can tell us a little bit more about what advocates can do and how they can take action this session. Yes, thanks, Jesse. Yeah, so as always, we encourage advocates to stay informed and to take action throughout the legislative session, um, including attending forums like this one. Um, so, and additionally, on our um, advocacy toolkit that's on our website, it's um, one of the tabs there at the top, um, we offer a number of ways for you all to stay informed. We have links to the legislator lookup tool to find who represents you in Frankfurt and how to contact them. Um, I sent that earlier in the chat and when you type in your address, pops up um, who represents you in Frankfurt, you know, their email address, even their social media channel. So you can go ahead and give them a follow, contact them that way. Um, we know a lot of legislators are active on Twitter. So that is um, one way to stay informed. Um, we also will have our bill tracker um, where we'll have that updated with blueprint priorities that are that were discussed today, as well as some of those other bills that are good for kids. Um, we've already started to populate that, um, and that'll continually be updated um, as bills are filed and as bills move. So um, bookmark that, save that um, to refer back to throughout the session. And then there are also links for signups for our email updates and to follow us on social media so you can stay updated on that bill movement. Um, that's how we send out you know, live tweets during um, committee meetings as bills move, send out our statements, and of course, any action alerts. Um, so great way to stay updated on any of those action alerts that we send out where um, we're encouraging advocates to take uh, action on like a specific bill by contacting their legislator. Um, we also on that advocacy toolkit include links to the Legislative Research Commission website, so the LRC, um, and that's where you can find information, um, including what Mahek shared on schedules, committees, bills, and um, of course, who your legislators are. They also have a tool there. Um, and then on that LRC site, you can click bills um, to see options where you can track um, all the bills that are happening, um, as well as um, sign up for a bill watch. So, you know, if there are bills that aren't necessarily on our on our tracker on our website, that's another way to stay informed on what is happening. Uh, and there's also, as we mentioned, um, KET is so good on sharing all of what's happening in Frankfurt and keeping us informed. And they have a constant a live stream of what's happening in the General Assembly. So all the committee meetings and um, when when our legislators go into chambers. So that is one of the, the great tools that we love to share because that's the best way to stay informed is watching it live. <laughs> it is a great way to stay informed. And yeah, shout out to KET for all that they do to help Kentuckians stay informed in general about what's happening in the General Assembly. So um, yeah, they have uh, actually two separate live streams so that you can, mm -hmm. you can watch um, the committees. Uh, so before we leave today, we wanna to take a few minutes to tell you all about Children's Advocacy Week. And I am trying to contain my <laughs> excitement um, as I, 
ask Mara about this because I am so excited about this year. I think all of us here went through a few weeks of mourning when we realized that we were not going to be able to have our usual Children's Advocacy Day in Frankfurt with, you know, hundreds of people in the rotunda and the cheering and everybody seeing their legislators. Um, but all that mourning has passed because we are so excited about what, uh, what we have planned for Children's Advocacy Week and all the different ways uh, for advocates to connect with one another and to hear from legislators and reach out to their legislators. So we shared just a little bit of information, but Mara, can you tell folks more about what to expect and uh, you know what we know so far about Children's Advocacy Week? Absolutely. Um, so if you don't follow us on social media or aren't on our email signups, um, it, well, if you are, I'm sure you've heard about it lots and lots because we've been promoting it um, over the last few months, but please sign up. Um, we'll drop the link there in the chat um, and sign up for updates, but a few things of note. So all of the events will be virtual during the week, uh, the first week of February. So when our legislators come back uh, to Frankfurt, so February 1st through the 5th, and each day will include um, a featured event, so a blueprint for Kentucky's children information session with legislators and partners from regions um, across the Commonwealth. So some regional events to really dive deep into what um, that region cares about um, and to speak with those individual legislators. Um, and then policy forums with legislative leaders um, as well as members of the Bashir administration. So really hearing from our leaders across the spectrum. Um, we are excited to share that Governor Bashir and leaders in the House and Senate will be joining us live for a virtual rally for our virtual rally for Kentucky's kids. And that'll be happening on Tuesday, February 2nd at 10 a.m. And then we'll also be joined by Lieutenant Governor Coleman uh, for a conversation on Thursday, February 4th at 11 a.m. Um, and, you know, you can scramble to write that down in your calendar. We'll also be sharing this information um, later. So um, just, just one note there. So we'll also be scheduling some one-on-one -on -one conversations with additional state leaders and legislators, as well as a media panel for a deeper look into Frankfurt happenings and a panel discussion with actions needed to advance racial equity in the Commonwealth with some of our legislators of color. So some important uh, events to note, and we hope that you all can join us. Um, and you can attend virtually to as many and as few of those events as you can or want. And um, we will be launching an app, which we're really, really excited about. That'll make it easier to kind of keep track of all of the happenings, the documents um, that may be helpful. And um, so that there can kind of be some engagement still. We know folks, when you come to the Capitol, it's so great, you know, take that selfie uh, with each other and just that excitement. So we, we want to try to still have that. Um, so we're hoping to still have some engagement and some fun um, through that app. Um, and we'll be launching those next week. So stay tuned. Um, and one thing that I'm really excited about, I know some of our team members are excited about, is um, how we're gonna visualize some art um, and some of our Kentucky kids. So if you've attended CAD Children's Advocacy Day in the past, you know we usually have kids singing in the rotunda. We have um, kid art and quotes um, throughout the Capitol Tunnel um, between the annex and the rotunda. And uh, we're gonna miss that this year. So we, if you haven't seen, we've put out a call for all kids across Kentucky to submit um, art or, um, you know, a quote or pictures or however, whatever they're interested in, them singing, um, doing, you know, a dance, whatever it is. And we'd love to try to highlight those, whether it's before our virtual events, um, the rally, or just sharing it on social media. So we still want to kind of have that fun component um, to be able to share with advocates and for our legislators to see um, how much our kids care um, about, you know, the advocates who are advocating for them. So, so um, please register and encourage your colleagues to register and any youth that you may work with to also register um, as a week long virtual event. There are sessions that um, will interest everyone, we think, we hope. Um, so, and plus there will be recordings afterwards if you can't attend live. So if anything, register, um, you know, save that, um, the web page where we'll have all of the, the scheduled information so you can refer back to it and download anything um, if you missed, missed it live. So as a reminder, 
follow us on social media, register all those fun things um, to stay informed. And yeah, we thanks we thank you all for for wanting to be involved. Thanks, Mara. And um, yeah, just as Mara said, we're we're sort of building this schedule as we confirm with legislators, as you all can imagine, coordinating with legislators. They've got a whole lot going on right now. So we're firming up their schedules um, or events with them this week, and, and we'll have more to announce next week. And we're just going to announce those as we go. Uh, just a little bit more info about that app and how you'll be able to plug into events. So that app will hold the schedule, some ways to have some social connections and documents. All of the events will be either via Zoom or via Facebook Live or both. So it's not a separate platform to actually participate in the events. It's really to help you with the scheduling. So more information coming soon when we launch that next week. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Patricia, to close us out today. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and thanks to all my team members for all of this uh, hard work and planning. Um, and thanks to all of you uh, who joined us today for sticking around and um, hanging in with us. We also want to thank Aetna Better Health of Kentucky for their support of today's Advocate Virtual Forum. Um, and I think my big takeaway is there's a uh, lots of room for you all to get involved. Uh, lots of ways, uh, lots of issues for you to speak out for kids and lots of um, ways that you can do so. So kids are counting on all of us and um, we're gonna be following up, look for an email from Jesse with a ton of all the links to all the information we shared today um, and dig in. Um, looking ahead, uh, to next week, we're not going to have a forum, but we will have a Facebook Live about Children's Advocacy Week. Um, and then the following week on January 27th, uh, we'll have a Children's Advocacy Week prep. We'll, we'll have even more information about how you can get involved that next week. Um, so we're all super excited about that um, and looking forward to sharing with you then and hope to see you.